So, hello everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Val Rose. I'm commissioning the editor uh, for architecture at Lund Humphreys. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you to this panel, which celebrates the publication of Hugh Campbell's book, Space Framed Photography, Architecture and the Social Landscape. Um, and first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you once more here for entrusting us with this wonderful book. Um, as many of you will be aware, Hugh's been interested in the relationship between architecture and photography for quite some time. And this book builds on his extensive and scrupulous, scrupulous research into the subject. Um, the book is a series of beautifully written and evocative illustrated essays with text and images creating a fascinating dialogue. Uh, these explore how leading fine art photographers from the early 20th century to the present day frame and construct the built environment in a similar way to architecture does. Hugh's analysis of these photographs is engaging, intelligent and insightful. He reveals how they depict or suggest relationships between human beings and their environments. As you'll see from the flyer on the screen, we're pleased to be offering um, we're pleased to offer you a special discount price for the book available on our website by using the code listed. Please do take advantage of this. This evening, Hugh has brought together a fantastic panel of artists and academics, Mary Woods, Mark Pimlet, Thomas Truth, Ashley McCoy, and Jesus Vasalo Fernandez. And I would like to thank them all very much for participating in this evening. Um, each speaker has selected one photograph from the book and will examine this and use it as a point of departure for their talk. Um, there will then be some time at the end of the event for questions, so um, please do type in your questions throughout the evening using the chat function and Hugh will select as many as possible to discuss. Um, and <laughs> Sorry. I think we need to ask people to mute as well. Yes, that's it. Just before we begin, um, yes, please do mute. Just before I mute, you know the chat is disabled, just to let you know. Oh, right. Oh. Okay, and that's really just over to you now um, to begin our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Val. And thanks, thanks everybody for being here. It's, it's amazing to have so many people um, gathered on a, on a screen. Unfortunately, gathered on a screen, it would be nice to be doing this um, in person. But on the other hand, if I was um, doing it in person, I wouldn't, I think, have, be able to have invited um, the people that I've invited uh, and have so many people attending as well. So, so there are advantages to the restrictions of the screen. Um, I just, um, I would like in, to begin really by thanking uh, Val, Val Rose, um, the commissioning editor for this book. I'd, I'd really like to thank her, I suppose, for taking what I would have thought of as something of a leap of faith in um, agreeing uh, or asking or discussing and agreeing to publish this book and for sticking with it um, as it de developed uh, over a few years with some delays. Um, so for keeping faith with it, Val, um, thank you very much. And it's really been uh, great to work with you on it. And um, I know from others, anybody I talk to who has published books with Val always wants to do another one, which must be a sign of a good editor, um, and, and, and which is something relatively rare, I would say. Um, maybe just to say a little bit about the birth of the book itself, and I'll be very brief um, about this. Um, my interest in photography began as I think it probably does for, oh, I need to, yeah, as it, as it does, I think, for many people. Um, well, as I describe in the book, I tended to use photographs in trying to, in teaching about architecture, not for, yes, for their own value, but really for what they said about the built environment, and particularly uh, the work of Henri Cartier-Bresson. Um, and that the you know the credo of the decisive moment um, became very important for me at a certain point, as it does for for, for so many people. 
um, that idea that action and situation, as in this uh, famous image of the cyclist going down the steep uh, street with the stair in the foreground, that action and situation coalesce in significant form. And images like his seem to me to offer a way of understanding architecture, understanding the designed and built environment, let's say, as setting for human life. Uh, and a settings that can produce these um, rhymes, these moments of uh, concordance, a word that I discovered in looking back over the book that I use far too much and never realized I did. Um, but alongside the sort of physical concordance um, between, uh, <clears throat> I'm having trouble uh, <clears throat> scrolling forward, um, that alongside the, the this physical concordance, uh, Use your trackpad, uh, Hugh. Got it. Just press on. Great. Yeah, and I suppose that 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 interest in physical concordance was coinciding at the time. I remember as well making a lot of use of uh, Hertzberger's lessons for students in architecture, and in that book, images like the one you see on the right seem to me to be kind of speaking the same language as as Cartier-Bresson. One could imagine him alighting upon a situation like this uh, for one of his photographs. So there was an understanding in architecture, I think, as well, of this idea of space as setting um, for human life. Um, at the same time, it's kind of been an interest in this physical uh, rhyming, if you like, between people and situation. I was also interested in the sort of psychological concordance that, 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 one, that could emerge between people and place in how our internal states might respond to or correlate with our surroundings and how photography could speak of this um, despite it, despite or maybe because of its limitations, its limitations in presenting what it, it sees in front of it. Um, that's why there's quite a lot in the book about portraiture, uh, sometimes directly, uh, sometimes more indirectly. Um, the, um, the book, uh, I suppose, emerges out of, among other things, uh, a lot of teaching that I've done, a seminar that I ran called Space Framed, hence the title of the book, which I ran for a number of years uh, with Alice Clancy, who I think is here, um, and who I wanted to thank uh, specifically because Alice was really instrumental in a lot of the um, thinking, I suppose, that made its way eventually into, these, into this book, and indeed instrumental in a number of the papers um, that we uh, produced and presented together. Uh, so my thanks um, to Alice. And I suppose out of that um, seminar, the, the, I kind of, uh, my interest kind of began to coalesce around the idea of, I suppose I would call it the constructed scene, this idea that seemed common to both disciplines. So in the book, there's chapters that consider instances of what, what one would consider the constructed scene. And I think we'll see in some of the, the images that are speakers are talking about instances of that as well. Um, so, and the chapters try to encompass variously the space of the photographs themselves, but also the space of their making and the space of their reception. So they're interested in the techniques and the practice of photography, but they're also interested in the social and cultural context within which these images appear and circulate. In one of the essays I quote, um, uh, Ian Foster's Room of the View, where Mr. Emerson says, I never notice much difference in views because they're all alike, because all that matters in them is distance and air. On the contrary, I would say that views matter precisely because the distance and air is different in each instance. And I would think in a way that it's the managing of that distance and air that is the business of photography. And just to mention, I think as well, worth mentioning this image uh, by Walker Evans, which seemed to me in, in a way to epitomize this capacity of photography uh, to capture the social um, landscape. It speaks in a single image of a whole, in a single image, it really it evokes a whole culture, a place, a situation, but also speaks of the way in which, you know, in which we inhabit space simply by decorating a surface or by painting a wall, by gathering objects, and then also speaks of the way that a, photo, a, a photographer can respond to that. A surface 
seen in life become the surface on the screen and so on. I won't say more about that, but I just wanted Walker Evans to be there somewhere because he is one of the presiding spirits um, of this book. Now, one of the great um, <coughs> pleasures of working on this book with Val and with the team at Lund Humphreys was that um, they, they do images properly, uh, which is extremely important. And anyone who's familiar with academic publishing will know that it can be very, very difficult to get images properly reproduced. Most often they're not or to get sufficient images to kind of um, <coughs> explain um, and uh, or elaborate an, an argument. So it really was a pleasure to be able with this book uh, to work with the designer, uh, Jackie Cornish and others um, to bring uh, all of these images together. And, and, and in a way, it's a book that's to be looked at as much as to be read. Um, to me, it's just about saying, look at these images. They're worth attending to. They have things to tell us. Um, in gathering all these images, again, anybody who's been involved in academic publishing will know how difficult it is to chase up all the permissions and the copyrights involved with images like these. So again, I need to say a special thank you to Gerbala McManus, who I know is here, because um, Gerbala was able to work with me. Uh, I say work with me. She really did it all um, in, in chasing up all of the permissions um, for all of these images, um, which was uh, really hugely helpful and also actually to acknowledge that a, a, a number of artists including Thomas Struth um, were really very 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 um, forthcoming and very um, generous in allowing images uh, to be used uh, which I think added a lot uh, to the book this the the, the <coughs> an image a case in point would be the image on the cover which is an image by uh, the English photographer Mark Power who people may know um, May know, may know may know him as an avid Leicester fan, um, among other things. But Mark <coughs> Power, this is an image from his series called Good Morning America, the second volume of that. It's a great series, I, if, if people know it. Um, but but I suppose this image seemed to present itself uh, for the cover among a few reasons. I mean, it's an urban landscape in portrait format, which is good uh, for the cover of a book. But also, and um, in a way, evidently, it evokes <coughs> the idea um of the land of the urban landscape as a kind of stage it feels like a setting that's waiting uh, for something to happen um <clears throat> it 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 it's uh it's it's a framework for life uh, and i think that's why um it made its way onto the cover and then just to get into the uh the the business of the evening by way of the cover itself and this subtitle Photography, architecture, and the social landscape. Now Val will know that till very late on, this subtitle was actually photography, architecture, and the inhabited environment. A, a much less <coughs> felicitous phrase that she rightly said at a certain point, we can't call it that. Even though it's accurate, it doesn't really evoke anything. So the switch to the social landscape was a late but a very a, a good suggestion I think and I think the suggestion of the, the the subtitle is that there's that these three are inextricably bound uh, together as a kind of triad photography architecture and the social landscape that any photograph of a social landscape includes necessarily its architecture that any social landscape might be in part structured through its architecture and reinforced through photographic depictions that photographs involving architecture necessarily deal with and speak of the larger social landscape and that these those interrelationships i think keep deepening and evolving so the purpose of this event is to bring together people who contribute i think in various ways to our understanding and appreciate of those relationships between photography architecture and the social landscape i've asked each of them to talk briefly about aspects of what they do in their research their writing their practice uh, in part, I hope they will serve to fill in some of the many gaps in the book and to offer new directions and ideas. So the invitation, as Val said, was to use one of the images included in the book, in one case, their own image, as a starting point, to talk about it in its own terms or as a point of departure. Um, and I should say that each of the people that I've invited to participate have played an important part in the coming together of this book and in my own thinking about the subject. So it really is a delight and an honor uh, that they've all agreed to participate. So now, in thinking about 
a question of how photography reveals and speaks of the social environment. Um, <clears throat> our first speaker is really, I th think, extremely well positioned to address that question. I've been very happy to, uh, I knew Mary Woods first through her book, Beyond the Architect's Eyes, published I think in 2009, a really brilliant um, book about the role of photography in the depiction of um, and the understanding of the American uh, built environment. And more recently, Mary has been publishing a lot on Indian architects and architecture. And I know she's also working on a book about the post-industrial landscapes in photography. So I'm really delighted. And I've since reading Mary's work, I've come to know uh, and become friendly with Mary and had the pleasure of working with her on a number of projects. Um, so I'm really delighted that she's able to be here despite slightly tricky internet uh, from Ithaca, Cornell, where she's just become Professor Emerita, just retired uh, from Cornell. Um, Mary, uh, could I invite you to uh, share? I'll stop sharing. If I could invite you to share your screen. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Hugh. And I have to say, I'm really blessed and honored to have you as a friend and colleague. And I have to say many congratulations on this wonderful book, and also to Val and all of her team at uh, Lund Humphreys. Um, I'm just going to so, stop sharing my screen. Sorry, Mary, I just need to stop. Oh, no, sorry. no problem. Um, for some reason, my... Uh, and I'll just say, as usual, I am the, you know, technophobe. So, um, uh, uh, so Victoria has very kindly uh, agreed to, to run my slideshow for you since my internet will stutter and it'll be a little slow in coming. I've got it. Um, so if I could have the first image. Okay. Yeah, this is like the old days with the Kodak carousels when I need to see the next screen. So thank you very much. Um, um, given that space framed, oh, should I start? Okay, sorry. Um, given that space framed is a work of art in its imagery and design, as well as an incisive and insightful study, I selected a photograph, and if I could have the next image. Thanks, you from John uh, Sharkowski's The Idea of Louis Sullivan to Discuss. It is another work of art about photography, architecture, and the social landscape. And uh, this book by Sharkowski also anchors Hugh's second chapter. As analyzed by Hugh, its texts and images have enriched my current work on post-industrial landscapes in India and the United States. So thank you very much, Hugh. Published in 1956, Sharkowski's book has a vertigo-inducing downward view of the Wainwright Building in St. Louis on its cover. Um, as he explained in the book's foreword, the effort has not been to compile an exhaustive documentation of Sullivan's buildings, but rather to enliven by me the photograph, the fundamental concepts which were born in his book. And if I could have the next. Thank you so much. Um, nevertheless, it was the guaranteed building seen here that first inspired um, uh, Sharkowski to undertake this study. Designed by the fabled partnership of Dankmar Adler and Louis Sullivan, the guarantee building was the last building that they designed together. Completed in 1895 and renamed the Prudential Building, it was then the tallest building in um, uh, Buffalo, New York at 13 stories and 167 feet. Now here I have to note that Sharkowski was no hit and run uh, artist or photographer. He had an ongoing relationship with this skyscraper, its people and its city. When he first began photographing the Guarantee Building in 1951, he was also teaching uh, uh, at the Albright School of Art in, um, in uh, Buffalo as well. So again, he wasn't a hit and run photographer. Uh, let's see, in the chapter on the Guarantee Building, Charles Kowski pairs a tightly framed straight on view of its upper stories with excerpts about the function and form from Louis Sullivan's kindergarten chats. And that will be the modality in the design of the book throughout. And if I could have the next. Oh, am I in full screen? Sorry. No, that's okay. So um, I'll just say arguably the guarantee building best um, 
embodies Sullivan's dictum for the skyscraper that form follows function to create every inch of proud and soaring thing. And as Hugh observes, this picture where the facade fills the frame is unusual for publications on architecture, but it is crucial for the different kind of image making that is attempted here. In the 1950s, again in the book's forward, Sharkowski writes, the guaranteed building was old and dirty and largely lost among its newer and larger neighbors. And here I've just inserted a 1971 view of downtown Buffalo. And in the background, you can barely make out the darkened form of the guaranteed building. It's just behind the church spire. Um, sorry, I couldn't figure out how to draw a red circle around it. Um, Sharkowski writes, the guarantee was like a diamond in a pile of broken glass. It stopped few passers by. I was seeing the building not as a work of formal architecture, but as a real building, which people had worked in and maimed and ignored and perhaps loved, and which I felt was deeply important. Here, the guarantee buildings, people and their offices, are framed by large windows. Its steel framework encased in the taut terracotta skin is one with Sullivan's rich and diverse ornamentation. Now to get to my chosen image. Of course, as a historian, I have to have all this prologue. So if I could have the next image. Yeah, that one. This particular image from the idea of Louis Sullivan Sullivan juxtaposes the life of the street with Adler and Sullivan's architecture. Here, Sharkowski brings together the genres of street photography and architectural photography. In this image, art and capitalism, technology and consumerism pair in an uneasy but dynamic relationship. And opposite the image are excerpts, again, from Sullivan's kindergarten chats under the pointed heading of, of um, revulsion decrying the cheap dollar man who has invaded the city and presumably the space around the guarantee building. If I could have the next. This skyscraper, a city under one roof, is for the men that we see in the streets, but also women who are alluded to in the posters of elegantly coiffed models amongst the shampoo boxes and cream jars that are crammed into the window display of this drugstore. This image was surely what Sharkowski meant when he wrote, I found myself concerned not only with the building's art facts, but with its life facts. Louis Sullivan had claimed they were the same. This concern began to show in the photographs and the idea grew. In the 1950s, the Guarantee Building, now worn, sooty, and deserted by first-class tenants, reflected the city's declining fortunes. And if I could have the next, Hugh, thank you. Yeah, is that right, Mary? Uh, yeah, now it is. Thank you. Open to 1959, the St. Lawrence Seaway bypassed the city of Buffalo, as you can see in this image on the lower right hand side, um, and made the Erie Canal that had once enriched the city now completely obsolete. And if I could have the next. Seeking modern and larger facilities, Buffalo steel and automobile industries decamp for the suburbs and sunbelt cities, impoverishing the city even further. As you can see in these images, in the decades that followed social unrest and climatic disa uh, disasters um, battered the city. In fact, Buffalo is still tr struggling to uh, recover from this deindustrialization that began in the 1950s. In the 1970s, local activists saved the Guarantee Building from being destroyed by its out-of-town owners, and they raised funds to restore and upgrade it. A law firm, one of its preservation champions, purchased the Guarantee Building and is now its sole occupant. The lively commercial spaces that Sharkowski photographed now house exhibitions about the building in the city. So this is kind of ossification of the dynamism of the Guarantee Building. And if I could have the last slide. Through the text and images, John Sharkowski created an archive of the Guarantee Building's afterlives, intertwining its architecture with its tenants and users long after its designers were gone. 
As Hugh writes so well in his chapter on Sharkowski, Sharkowski's pictures allow us to trace and reverse the path from image to lived experience, communicating completely and precisely the encounter with Sullivan's buildings, their art facts and their life facts, their role in countless unwritten autobiographies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. That was great and wonderful. Uh, um, I'm going to move straight on. We'll have the opportunity at the end to come together and discuss. And pe if people have questions, please, as Val said, if you just put them in the chat, any comments you might have, and we'll try and uh, pick them up at the end. But I'm going to move on on this whistle stop um, tour. And uh, next, I want to introduce um, Mark Pimlet. Mark will be known um, to many of you as um, architect, artist, um, teacher, uh, writer um, of books such as, <coughs> importantly, Without and Within, a, a, a book that I know is important to many uh, architects and artists, and also his book of photographs in passing, uh, because Mark is a really, really fine uh, photographer. and. Um, among other things, I think what Mark is particularly um, uh, uh, alert to is this, the ways in which we inhabit space and the ways in which photography can reveal those processes of inhabitation. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to have been able to work with Mark and have many conversations with him over years about these themes, about photography or about architecture, about Manchester United and many other things. Um, but this evening, Mark's part, point of departure is uh, an image by Timothy O'Sullivan. And Mark, I'm going to stop sharing and let you share your screen now. Great. Uh, I'm, in, I'm muted. Uh, how do I do? There we go. Lovely. Well, first of all, you thank you very, very much. Um, I'm really honoured and touched to be here with you tonight and, of course, with my esteemed colleagues. And it's really great to see you again, Thomas. Um, um, this is the photograph that uh, Hugh was referring to. It's by Timothy O'Sullivan, entitled Desert Sand Hills Near Sink of Carson, Nevada around 1867. Many years ago, around the same time as I acquired Kunsthal Bern's publication of Thomas Struth's photographs, Unconscious Places from 1987, I saw Timothy O'Sullivan's photograph of a sand dune reproduced in space framed and, um, and in, Daniel Wolf's, in Daniel Wolf's The American Space, meaning in 19th century, landscape photography from 1983. In the photograph, the photographer's mobile darkroom and horses are set against the almost featureless dune, giving some indication of scale, of human presence without a human, and um, a tentative notion of the possibility of occupation. The setting of the view is enigmatic, unknown, unknowable. It is alien and might as well be the surface of the moon and the effects of the Apollo, Apollo landings as photographed by one of the astronauts or of Mars and one of, as, and, uh, one of the rovers as they photographed themselves. This photograph and one that follows now, the Ruby Desert, on the opposite page of Wolf's book, reinforced my own thoughts about the photograph's capacity to possess that which was depicted. In the context of the great surveys of the continental territory of the 1860s, for the purpose of understanding what could be done with and extracted from what would become a colonized interior, I understood that the photographic view was at once scientific, a piece of the machinery of colonization and uh, uh, an element of propaganda 
for the works of that colonization. It led, in my case, to a way of both making pictures and writing about that colonization of territory and its relation to the continuous interior of neoliberal urbanization and the networks of its public interiors. But the photographs of O'Sullivan seem to lack the plenitude of those of his, of his contemporaries, such as Carlton Watkins, in whose photographs the territory was depicted to represent Edenic promise. There was something else, and it seemed to be connected with the photographer's approach to the subject, which maintained the subject's specific identity, its otherness. It was something close to empathy. In making the view, in making the photograph in this way, the approach to the other might be something more than possession and something indeed closer to empathy. And this has been important to me. When I was a child, I made photographs. At least there is evidence of a couple of strips of film from 1965 and 1970. I made them as a child with a sense of the significance of the world and iconic figures of that world, my mother, an airport parking lot, pet cat, for example. These scenes too had a symbolic quality. They seemed to speak of the world and its ideas. It seemed to me that the ideas of many times and many places all coexisted, inscribed into the appearances of the world, and that by ph photographing the world, it might be possible to witness those ideas as they unfolded and revealed themselves in the fabric of a constructed world. I was aware as I began to make photographs purposefully again, that I, made, I was making photographs of places and interiors without people, as topographic photographs. Shortly thereafter, through my turn towards art making, I became more aware of the work of Bernd and Hille Becher, and then the photographs of Thomas Stuhl. They affected me deeply, partly because I found the photographs at once beautiful and uncanny, and partly because I recognized them. Now, this photograph of Dieselstrasse, taken from Unconscious Places on page 29, was familiar to me, despite the fact that I had never been there. Its directness echoed the ways I had seen the world as a child, and it appeared in the view in all its complexity, ordinariness, emptiness. The photograph shared a quality of stillness, of silence, with 19th century urban topographic photography, such as that of Marville and Arget. The street itself, photographed centrally from a slightly elevated viewpoint was unexceptional, but it had an appearance or rather an accumulation of incidents within its physiognomy that modestly uttered the facts and ideas of life and its organization. Its acceptance and representation of these utterances for all the, their incompleteness and imperfections made me think that my own quixotic approach to listening to the appearances of the world through making photographs was not without hope. In fact, it was necessary. These utterances could be seen in the details of the landscape, which had been made by people full of purpose and perhaps hope, regardless of their clumsiness or mawkishness. They could be seen in the constitution of the entire urban fabric as it undertook the apparently endless process of beginning each iteration, that of an idea of itself, which more often than not was contingent on an idea of somewhere else. 
beginning, constantly beginning, a confrontation with that which was not known, with otherness, with what was known and what was hoped for. A constructed environment made of ideas, hopes, ideals, ideals, dreams of other places. absent-mindedness. Within, people constructed environments of controlled, staged scenes intended to create atmospheres, to stifle their children, to shape subjects, interiors of intimations, allusion, fantasy, memories, utility, projection, posterity. All of these without and within, human. As when I was a child, I made photographs that were as though I was seeing the world expressing itself for the first time and accepted its appearances. A lot of the places I made pictures of were made with ideas about an imagined future and an aspect of awe about the past. As a child, because of the circumstances of my environment and an inkling of otherness, the idea of otherness, I understood childishly perhaps, that these appearances were connected to other appearances and their authors elsewhere and in other times. In all of them, there was and remains the hope of beginnings of life and a subtle recognition of its limits that we all share. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Beautiful. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you, Mark. Um, back to me. <laughs> Again, we, we will have opportunity to discuss uh, everything at, at, at the end. Um, excuse me, I just need to play. So our next uh, contributor is, uh, is Thomas Struth. Um, and Thomas really needs uh, no introduction. Uh, we were very pleased to have Thomas as a, as a speaker at a conference and myself and Alice Clancy organized in 2017. Mark was there as well. It was called Constructing the View. I remember meeting him off a Ryanair flight, which at that stage was still the really the only means of getting from Berlin to Dublin. Uh, he, he, he came off with a heavy cold, but um, uh, we were really delighted that he made the effort to come and it was fantastic to be able to host him uh, in Dublin. Uh, Thomas Truth's work really needs no introduction. Um, he, he appears twice uh, in the book. There is an essay in the book about the series on conscious places, which Mark just mentioned, a large selection of which uh, featured in the, I was surprised it's so far, so long ago now, the 2012 Venice Biennale, the, the one that David Chipperfield um, uh, curated. Um, and in fact, as I remember now, that was the first time that I approached uh, Thomas uh, about coming to Dublin. Um, anyway, I'm glad he's here again virtually. The second, in fact, the first appearance, his first appearance in the book is this famous, very famous image of the Pantheon in Rome, which I use uh, in one of the early chapters to talk about the coalescing, if you like, or the rhyming of spatial and social and psychological formation and how a photograph can reveal that. Um, and nobody better, I think, than Thomas Truth to talk about how photography can reveal architecture. There's lots of really great pictures included in the book and one particularly bad one, which is this one, which I took uh, after a, a, fly, a long flight to Dallas and an amazing visit to um, the Kimball, the Louis Kahn's Kimball Art Museum. And then I came, came back and drove aimlessly around downtown Dallas for a while looking for the exact place from which Thomas Struth took one of his most famous photographs of a Dallas parking lot. This is my version and I, I think 
Thomas is going to talk about his version. I'll leave it to you. To yeah, uh, yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. Can you show that picture? Because I was not briefed here that I that I should prepare to have it. I mean, this is yeah. my picture. <laughs> that one. I could show that. that. No. Yeah. So, so uh, it's a brief time. So I, yeah, I um, thank you first for, for writing about this. I was very, well, when I got your book, I, was, I thought, oh, this is amazing. This is one of the best uh, uh, essays that, that everyone has written about uh, uh, unconscious places. Uh, um, I um, so I, the first I want to briefly describe how I how that happened. The, like the small like the, the short pretext of this picture. I was invited in in two thousand to do a you know, to do an exhibition at the Dallas Art Museum, which was exciting. Ultimately, went from from Dallas to Los Angeles then to Metropolitan Museum and to Chicago. And I made, um, I made a, a year before that happened, I made a, a four week journey to all the four places, the four cities to look at the spaces, to talk to the people, which by the way, was a great thing because I uh, stopped uh, reading the news or watching news on TV for those entire four weeks, uh, which made me think at the end it was very, uh, very healthy because I, you know, I had a different focus. And so on. So when I was in Dallas, I um, it resonated a lot of things. Um, uh, uh, partly, you know, when I studied with the Betters, I read Jane Jacobs' book uh, about uh, uh, life and death of American cities. I had been um, working in Düsseldorf uh, uh, on the disappearance of the Rhine uh, Harbor, of the kind of industrial spaces that were there. I, um, I had discussed with Marion Goodman, who was born in the late uh, 20s of the last century about how the, 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 uh, the downtowns of big American, American cities had been ruined by real estate people, uh, as she used to say. So here I was in Dallas and I um, it, it became interested in, these, in this sculpture park of these buildings in downtown Dallas. And thought, yeah, yeah, and started location scouting, you know, how I could capture something, um, uh, yeah, uh, exemplary. I have to say that uh, during that time, I started to uh, look at architecture again, because uh, uh, for a while, while I was doing the museum photographs, and when, when I, uh, during the time I traveled to China, quite a bit in the mid nineties. And then when I started with the jungle photographs, I didn't look at architecture so much. And I thought maybe this is, uh, this chapter of my work is over. But then I, I um, started to make a, a small group of, of large uh, architecture pictures, which maybe are more, more uh, exemplary than the other photographs, the black and white pictures I had done previously. So uh, uh, driving around in Dallas, downtown with a car, I, I realized that the location, you know, that it was very difficult to, um, to um, find a position that, was, that would slice through the, the fabric of the, the city. And then I had, all of a sudden I had the idea, I'm just gonna drive into every parking lot and drive all the way up and see if I find, uh, something so that's what I did. This was maybe um, yeah the second or third uh, parking lot. When I got up there, I found it interesting. There was it has it, is, it had rained and there was this puddle. The, the, these puddles there were not too many cars, and particularly the cars were rather you very ordinary. You know Porsche, no no you know. In, no big SUV trucks. And then I, when I looked at this scenery, it instantly hit me of being composition of three slices of uh, topic. So uh, the rainy surface of the parking lot uh, would be reflecting, you know, partly re reflecting the mirrors. It also is a signifier of, of uh, is something that had just happened. So it's a very, it's a connotation of a, of a, of a, 
of a slice of time and an experience that does happen, it's also a signifier of, of, uh, of um, uh, you have odor, you know, sort of what, what it smells like when, when rain had just fallen and it's a physical bodily um, uh, signal. Then what you see in the middle of the red buildings are buildings uh, that have a lot to do with masonry, with brick building. And it's for me, when I thought about it again in preparation uh, for, for you know, thinking about what I could say, it seemed to me yeah, from a time where you know, certain agreements in society, uh, you know, you're not valuing whether they're good agreements or bad agreements, but they talk about um, a, a specific slowness of time, the time that it needs to build these buildings, the decisions of you know what these buildings look like, and so forth. Maybe not the the, the building on the on the middle right hand, maybe not. And then in the background, you have these these. Um, These, you know, this group of buildings that are both you know, maybe rivaling, but they also seem like teammates. You know, it's like a, you know, it's like characters of a soccer club, but in a way they're also um, they signify different you know, stage of capitalism in a way and of the production of buildings. And um, I was particularly. Uh, um, how can I say? Some, somebody had told me before that that one of these buildings um, was empty at the time. I think it's a slightly blue building, the like the fourth of the building from the left, because some of the, the, the IT preparation or the, the uh, conditions for, for IT usage in the buildings wouldn't match uh, uh, the, the um, contemporary needs. So this is the, you know, then also I decided to, to crop the, the photo, the, the frame at the top, which normally I don't do or rarely do, because I wanted by, by cropping um, at the tops of these two tallest buildings, I tried to bring the whole scenery more towards the view of my photograph. Um, of course, the, 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 to say, one more thing about the, the wet surface. It, it also yeah, has something to do with, with um, your 70s uh, American detective, your crime stories. So I, you know, in a way, photography is always, uh, um, you know, uh, maybe not always, but it has a lot to do. It's a still, it's a still image of a larger story. So for me, the, the aspect of a larger story um, is one of the, the most important things uh, for me to value what I, you know, what I intend to do. If it stays anecdotal, it's not, it's not good. Um, this began very early in my uh, earliest experience or practice as a photographer. I came from painting when I was, you know, when I was here in school, I, I painted and did a lot of drawings. When I, when I went to the academy uh, and studied painting, I slowly began to uh, make uh, photographs, um, which I wanted to use for my paintings. But, um, and in particular, I was already in my paintings interested in the relationship of the individual and, and, uh, and architecture or space, the individual in space. So when I started to photograph, I, 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 I took as a subject matter the most you, um, you common thing. I would go out on the street with, with a Minolta camera I had and would photograph passers-by. I did that for a year or so later on. I, 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 when I came to know the work of Walker Evans, I discovered that some of my pictures were very extremely similar to uh, uh, Walker Evans's uh, snapshots, but then I found out that it's that it, you know, that these pictures all stayed uh, 
be rather uh, anecdotal and they um, they didn't um, they didn't fulfill my desire to you know, to 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 express something that would uh, have a you know broader importance and then I I decided to to I, I raised the street itself uh, in Düsseldorf you represents you almost the same character uh, only you know, that buildings don't move all the time um, yeah um, so when now I make the strange experience that you know photographs that I took 40 years ago in New York they um, they, they, they don't look contemporary anymore simply because the cars you see in these pictures don't exist anymore or the, the streets are not filled with, with different cars. Um, yeah, I think that's what, uh, what I wanted to say. There's also something maybe uh, uh, last or least to say that uh, um, I'm always more interested in what kind of truth photographs can say rather than what they cannot say. Thank mm. you. Thank you, Thomas. That's a cliffhanger to end on <laughs> or something that definitely we, we might want to pick up on in the conversation. Uh, it's wonderful to know that you were also driving around parking lots in um, in Dallas. Um, uh, but um, our next contribution is from Ash Ashling uh, McCoy. And Ashling, um, I remember um, as a talented and ambitious student of architecture. Um, but of course, since she's graduated, she's been developing as an artist and working in photography and also as a photographer of architecture a lot of people will know her a lot of the architecture coming out of ireland over the past decade and more um but um you will also of course probably know her work her project specifically her project the radiant city which had this very interesting approach to trying to understand the culture of a particular architecture in that case the unité d'habitation by le corbusier and try and find a photographic language that might be able to speak of it and then more recently um, a project called Unlive the Space of the Door, which I'm not sure she's going to talk about, but which was based on, on Tempelhof Airport in Berlin. Um, Ashling is uh, going to share her screen, I think, and, and just say welcome and over to you, Ashling. Thank you for participating this evening. Thanks, you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to turn on my keynote and uh, share my screen. So hopefully that will work. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to say how honoured I am to be um, included in this in this evening in these talks. Uh, not just because of the literally brilliant lineup of other speakers, but also because when I was studying architecture in UCD, Hugh was one of our our tutors for history and theory. And uh, he really encouraged us to see architecture within this kind of expanded, uh, expanded field of both the arts, like both photography and and filmmaking, but also history, literature, psychology, sociology, linguistics. Um, so yeah, his work has had a big influence on me. So I'm very glad that his beautiful book is now out in the world, and that other people will benefit from his insight too. Um, so it was tough to pick one image from the book because there's obviously so much work there um, but this image by Alex South from Sleeping by the Mississippi has always kind of resonated with me. I'm trying to talk about in my own work um, about what it means to inhabit and what it means to uh, how, how our perception of place is affected by images um, and in one way it's a simple image but in other ways it's got so many complexities and kind of contradictions I mean you know, particularly like the fake wood and then the, the real impact or the real kind of trace of the images that are now gone 
like the absence of those images and yet the presence of the postcard and then even the postcard itself like which is a it's a painting of or it's a it's a photograph of a painting of an idealized landscape that actually is a real river so there's a kind of a lot going on there um, and what really gets me about the photograph is the fact that the postcard is left um, but that it once sat alongside some per like what I imagine to be personal images and um, images that had a value you know, they were framed and they were like they were presented um for quite a long time um, and i think that it, it kind of captures what jihani palisma I'm, I'm sure i'm not pronouncing his name properly but uh what he describes as lived space in that these iconic dream places these shared images our society kind of get mixed up with our own personal objects and our own memories and then we project them onto all the spaces that we encounter as a means to to inhabit and to kind of interact and um, imagine place. So, uh, so talks about sleeping by the Mississippi, not about being a book about the Mississippi, but about the idea of the Mississippi. And similar in my project, The Radiant City, looks at the Le Cabousier's um, Unité d'Abdiation um, as the utopia, as the idea of the of the the ideal place that doesn't exist, and through a very real building which is which is like a it still it still operates as a as a housing um housing unit um, and what i feel that's fascinating about the unite is this this power that it has as an idea this kind of iconic um status that it has and it's one that was i showed previously an image of le Corbusier's drawings and it felt like that that building almost came out fully formed it already had had this power and le Corbusier use that very deliberately. He was very aware of the survival of the building as a prototype, kind of depended on ideological buy-in from the public. Um, and that the practice of architecture is not just about building, but of imagining, of projecting myth. Um, so with the project, I wanted to address this role within architecture and photography of constructing the ideal and how that affects our, our experience of place. So in the book and in the exhibition, I played around with the kind of space of the photograph um, as a kind of third space um, or heterotopia. So on one hand, it references the real space, but it also questions the myth. Um, so I'm not sure there's a couple of few, I'm actually ahead of time here. This would hopefully uh, make exactly seven minutes. But so if that project dealt with the utopia, then the next project that I want to talk about, which is and Live the Space of the Door, which you mentioned, looks at the opposite of the of the utopia, the dystopia, or when our desire to inhabit or to imagine that good place is, is refused. Um, so the project looks at the situation of the refugee through the architecture of the uh, temple of the former Temple of Airport in Berlin, which has been used since uh, for the last couple of years as an emergency sh emergency shelter during the Syrian refugee crisis. And I suppose as an architect coming across the use of of an airport in this way, it just provokes the impossible question of how how to, how to inhabit an airport. And in a way, the, the the architecture then allows a kind of vehicle to to talk about this impossible situation. Um, I mean, like from an architect's perspective, an airport is designed for travel. It's designed to move through quickly. It's about speed. It's about the crowd. Um, there is no space for the individual. So conceptually, it's impossible to live there, to sort of imagine how you might inhabit it. Um, it's impossible to dwell there. And yet this is the situation of the refugee. It's the, the placelessness um, or the non-place of being both ph physically and politically waiting um, and between kind of future and past and, you know, acceptance and refusal. Um, so Samuel Beckett was quite an important reference point for me. Um, when I was making the project, uh, a lot of his plays have been described as failed forms. And I felt that 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 in a way, in his plays, I guess the, the lack of form or the lack of kind of um, story um, means that we're kind of stuck with these descriptions of waiting and this kind of realization of non-place. And it's it's more affecting or intense as an, as an experience of a viewer. So that's something I wanted to, to look to look at within the Berlin work, um, so to translate not necessarily what the refugee experience looks like, but kind of what it feels like, or at least 
to translate my incapacity of imagining what that would feel like. Um, so yeah, the architecture worked as a kind of vehicle to talk about that. Um, it has a very particular ideology in itself and a very dehumanizing scale. But also I, I use the images as a kind of refusal that the that it was a disorientation. It wasn't it wasn't allowing any access, any even imaginative access. Um, yeah, so it's literally like it it's it's a refusal to imagine space within within the space of the airport. Um, yeah, so my work in in general, I guess, is very like what I'm looking at through these projects is that is the overlap between architecture and photography, and if we imagine architecture, not necessarily about making places, but about imagining places. Architects generate images of places that don't exist, and then photography, in a way, comes at it from the opposite direction, and that it takes places and turns them into an image or into a, an idea of themselves. And then this kind of this feedback loop gets set up, where uh, you know visual uh, kind of culture gets set up, and that influences how we inhabit and everything else, but and how we make place meaningful. And it's what Hugh very eloquently termed uh, the rich world of imagination and adventure overlaid upon the raw grain of reality. Um, and sometimes I feel that in relation to other art forms that this constant tie back to reality can seem kind of like a, a restriction or something, but it's also what makes both of those disciplines so vital um, and genuinely interact and, and sort of, build. and you know, it's what Hugh, uh, references this kind of triad of, of architecture, photography, and the social landscape. So thank you. Thank you. That's me. I will stop sharing. Great to see that that work. Um, it's really beautiful. Um, and, uh, while you're unsharing, um, I'm going to yes. introduce our well, our, our almost our final speaker, um, Jesus Pasalo who's joining us from Houston, uh, where he's associate professor in Rice University. And Jesus is a uh, author of two of the really most compelling books, I think, about the relationship between photography and architecture uh, of recent years, those being um, Seamless Digital Collage and Dirty Realism, and his more recent book, Epics of the Everyday. I don't at all resent the fact that he produced those two books in less time than it took me to get this one out. Um, I can't resent that because he's such a generous and um, uh, open uh, and engaging uh, scholar, talker, writer, architect and teacher. It's been great to get to know Jesus and, 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 and to hear him speak about his work and I'm really delighted again that he's been able to, he's able to join us uh, for this event. So Jesus, um, as is the way these days, I'm going to ask you to share your screen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... And I actually would like to, to to return your your compliment because I think the what what has uh, come across to me in reading in reading your book is is actually how incredibly generous the the writing is. I think those of us who come to to the topic of photography through architecture, and I'm, I'm talking about myself primarily. I think I think in the end we do come at it with a with a very narrow lens or with a very narrow focus. It's, that's, it can be limiting. And then, if 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 in addition to that you're a professional academic, uh, that that that's like a, an additional layer of, of narrowness in a way that I think because of the way the university works today, when when we get to a topic, we have to bring to a to, to the topic a very strong agenda, which which again can be sort of inhibiting. Right? That we we come we come already with a lot of uh, preconceptions, I think, and then to be able to through your through your writing and your eyes look at at the different bodies of work that, that you discuss in the book, it's been really eye-opening to me. And uh, it's, re it's really, I think, inspiring to see the disinterested nature of, of the writing and how that allows for, for um, the reflection to be much much broader and, and in a way for the reader to get so much more out of it, which I think is also a huge a characteristic of yours that I think all of us colleagues who get to interact with you always come out of, of that collaboration much much richer and much better. So thank you for, for that and thank you for the invitation today. I have uh, chosen this image to talk about. It's an image by American photographer Stephen Shore and it's titled 
Second Street East and South Main Street, Kalispell, Montana, August 22, 1974. Uh, and it's part of his uh, uh, series titled Common Places. So the, the title itself already situates the image as part of uh, this tradition of uh, topographic photography, right? With, uh, by marking the place and the time where the, where the photograph um, was taken. It appears in uh, uh, the eighth essay in the, in the book, In Space Framed, and the essay is titled uh, The City in the Frame, From Winogrand's Glance to Shore's Gaze, where, uh, where, where he basically um, uses this comparison between the street photography that Winogrand is doing in the, in the sidewalks of, of Manhattan with this uh, landscape, the urban landscape photograph that sure is taken, is taken in the small towns and fields and, and sort of the periphery of the United States. Uh, and he uses that comparison basically to talk about something interesting that happens in that period in the 70s where photography is transitioning quite quickly from, from a very fast pace uh, to, to a much slower tempo, which, which has to do, and I think it has been already talked about today with, with perhaps <coughs> This uh, the impetus of the, the school of thought of the decisive moment losing a little bit of steam or, or becoming a little bit stale at that point in time, and then there, there's been a transfer of interest to uh, to basically a, a, a genre of architecture that is in between the landscape and, and the documentary, and that we we uh, come to talk about as as, as topographic in, in, in some in some uh, uh, ways. I, um, I, I thought in reading the article or in starting to read the article I, or the chapter, I thought, well, maybe this is something that could have done by, instead of comparing Pino Grant and Shore, just talking about the work of, of Shore, because Shore himself in, in his career has a, a moment of transition between a type of photograph that is more uh, like snapshot and then, and then this, this new type of Work basically. So, in in very very uh, a few years earlier, so this photograph is 1974. In 1972, he was uh, working on another project called American Surfaces, where it was also travel uh, photography was travel based, but the photography itself was much more uh, closer to snapshots, right? And and uh, it had a much quicker rhythm, and the, the appearance of the human figure was much different. Maybe this example that I, that I've chosen is not the best one because. This photograph of a breakfast table actually has a very calm uh, sort of a feel to it, but but I but I think if if the if the point is maybe to talk about the change of pace uh, uh, in terms of moving from the capture of a very decisive instant to a much sort of a, a slower a slower tempo, of trying to understand something with a, with a different time scale. Uh, yeah, it made me think of the choice, and then I realized, as I as I read more and I read deeper into the article, that it actually made a lot of sense to choose this comparison with, between Vinogrand and uh, and Shore because it was not only a change in the in the sort of techniques and the apparatus of photography; it was also a very important change in the in the content or the topic of the photographs. That at that uh, at that point in time, the uh, the Basically, the, the photograph of the metropolis and the sort of density and the type of, of hectic life that is engendered by the metropolis uh, was a very, very different topic from, from the life of uh, what we could call the, the suburbs, the, uh, the, the exurban qualities or the, the sort of fields and small towns of the periphery. And I, I think that, that change of content is crucial, the idea that photographers were shifting attention from center of society, the metropolis, to the periphery of society. So I think it's, it's a topic that, that is still in, important today. And in that, in that regard, this juxtaposition of Pino Grant and Shore is, uh, is very important. Uh, and I think the, 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 the significance perhaps was precisely that at that point in time, this, this work on the, on, the, on the sort of congestion and, and density and, 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 and sort of hectic quality of, of urban life had become a celebration of something that was sort of, uh, again, accepted as, as a sort of center you know, and, and culturally assimilated versus to, to shift the angle of the camera away from that and into these sort of lesser uh, explored realities was an attempt to shine light onto 
parts of the built environment and parts of society that were perhaps uh, omitted or even or even repressed. And I think that's the reason why Stephen Shore, who, who of course became hugely influential uh, um, in, in the field of photography, was also uh, an artist that was very important for architects. I think the architects in the 70s were really trying to make sense of, of new urban phenomena that had uh, that had been generated or appear re regardless or, or without their intervention, basically. And I'm thinking here of how uh, um, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown basically approached and collaborated with Stephen Shore around precisely the time of this photograph, as, as they asked him to collaborate and produce photographs for their Times of Life exhibition of uh, between 1975 and 1976. And, and, and the reason why I think the, the, I think what I'm trying to say is that I think there is a, there is a, a connection that, that, that is very interesting between this transition in the, in the emphasis in terms of um, photographic technique and, and photographic thinking, and this uh, shift in the sort of content or the, the focus of, of, uh, of photography itself, in the sense that if we compare uh, sort of previous more spontaneous types of photography with this uh, uh, work with the, the large format and the, and the sort of topographic approach, what, what we see is uh, you know, we have a much larger degree of, of control and, uh, and structure. Uh, and, which somehow is paired in my mind with the, with the actual lack of a structure of what is being uh, photographed, right? That, the, that these were urban phenomena that perhaps for, uh, uh, for, for artists and architects and in, in this period of time, in the 60s and 70s, were difficult to explain or difficult to, to, to apprehend because of, of a certain lack, lack of planning or lack of, lack of uh, uh, structure and that it took uh, a much more, um, structured view of things and, and a structured construction of the photograph to bring just enough order to the, to the to what was in the frame that we could actually start or that they could actually start to think about it in a, in a different way. And, and so I think that <clears throat> that in my mind is, is, is really important. And, and then maybe just to finish, and, and it has already been mentioned today, that what's, what's so incredible about the work of Stephen Shore is not only the degree of control and the coolness with which he manages to 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 organize things and to and to make it appear as if everything is falling into place but a really deep sense of empathy towards towards the world and uh, which is really I mean there's, there's this sort of in my mind incredible human quality to, to, to the way that he's able to to project this feeling of empathy towards things that may or may not be perfect that may or may not be lovable, and which I think also perhaps is very important and maybe something for us to, to revisit today as we confront so many realities that we don't that we don't really like and that are problematic to us. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. That's great. Um, and again, we, we hope to be able to gather everything together again. Um, I'm going to, I couldn't resist picking one image myself. So um, if you'll indulge me for a moment, um, I wanted to talk about this picture, which I'm always happy to talk about. I'm always happy to look at um, Helen Levitt, um, any photograph by Helen Levitt, really. Um, and as with so many of her photographs, this photograph sh shows children at play in New York. And as with so many of her photographs, it has an easy, miraculous balance and gracefulness. Now, the, the essay about Levitt in the book is the, is, the, is, the, is the earliest that I wrote. And in some ways, it set the tone, I think, for a lot of the book. And in a way, it was also the easiest because it's so evident what these photographs are demonstrating. I think it seems to me that the city supports and structures its inhabitants' lives, its inhabitants' activities, albeit that in the um, book, which contains that um, photograph and the second edition of the book where the photograph made it to the cover, um, James Agee in his introduction wants to argue for a slightly more contested relationship, I think, between the people and their surroundings. Um, 
Now, I could have picked any number of images by Levitt, and I confess I am going to be taking the opportunity to show you a few more. Just by way of background, of course, people will know um, that Helen Levitt came into photography partly through her friendship with Walker Evans. This is a photograph by Walker Evans of her while she was helping him with his subway portraits in the like 1936-1937. This is her photograph of Walker Evans. Um, which I've always liked, and I sort of think it's possibly influenced by this photograph by Cartier-Bresson. And of course, Cartier-Bresson was a huge influence on Levitt. She saw a show of his work, a number of shows of his work, and then met him when he was in the US. Um, and that credo of the decisive moment, which I spoke about earlier, that idea of finding the moment where things coalesce into significant form is really, I think, central to his work. And this idea that at that point where that significant form emerges, a certain distance arises from the subject matter itself, from the specifics of the moment. It's in a funny way, maybe a little bit like what Thomas is saying about when it moves beyond the anecdotal, you might say, and becomes something larger. So if you look at a photograph like this, which would have also been a contender to pick, fantastic photograph. Um, and then if you look at the, the images that lead up to that, the um, this sequence, sorry, it's not great. This is a close up of a book where there's a sequence from the, the film showing the frames. And then when you come to the final frame, this feeling of inevitability that it's just locking in finally. They're finally assuming their positions for the picture that we come to know. So the flow of life frozen um, at that particular moment. Um, now, in her patient mining, of a particular territory of a locale, the Spanish Harlem area, usually of New York's Upper West Side. And in her sympathetic but never sentimental relationship to her subjects, you do feel a kinship, certainly with Evans. And also, I think, with her attention to the built environment. In the essay, in the book, I talk particularly about her attention to the stoop, you know, this device that kind of navigates and allows somebody to kind of position themselves between the public and private realm. And that's the stoop figures in one way or another in more than half the um, the pictures in the way of seeing. Um, and she uses it, of course, for the way in which it structures relationships between people in space and sets up all kinds of uh, emotional resonances, as in that great picture on the right, where you really do wonder what that girl is thinking about that boy. Um, but it also, of course, structures the pictures. It gives depth, it gives, it distributes figures in space so that they can be distributed across the frame. In the essay, I talk about uh, what I decided to call an unconscious choreography that's always evident. And, 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 and Levitt was famously very interested in dance and planned a ballet based on her uh, photographs. We've lost you, Hugh. I think you, 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 you've disappeared. You have you muted yourself. I think. <laughs> Come back, Hugh. Oh. <laughs> we should write him. Am I back? You're back. Yes. I'm back. Okay. So Thank she, God. she has this ability to 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 isolate individuals or groups uh, in her pictures whether that's an individual like this again i would have happily chosen this picture the girl spider girl as it's usually known uh so one person twos there's many twos threes like this famous trio and um, sometimes a quartet like these wonderful group of girls with the bubbles rhyming with them uh sometimes as many as five um or even on occasion six, as in this again famous photograph of the boys gathered around the broken mirror, undoing the damage they've wrought. Um, and actually, remarkably, that one, two, three, four, five, six, those are the six images by Levitt that I included in the book without realizing um, that there is that sequence there. But she's always finding patterns. Uh, and she's always able, as I say, to isolate these, make these groupings have a significance within their surroundings. So let's come to the picture that I was going to talk about, made in 19, about 1940 in Spanish Harlem, as I say. And, and she's been tracking this trio of boys for a while during the day. 
um, there's at least one. I've seen others, but the only one I could find. She often uses uh, this this device, this sideways viewfinder called a Winkelstuker, so that she shoots not directly at the, the subjects, but she looks like she's photographing at right angles to them. So they are not, they're aware of her presence, but they're not necessarily aware of being uh, photographed. Here they are. This is a shot that comes, I think, before. Um, and I have seen a couple of others. And again, it's that interesting thing of how, how fleeting the moment of perfect congruence that she actually captures is. In this one, it's interesting to see that there's an American flag in the background in front of the school, I think it is. There's more sky and the kind of balance of the bodies is much less um, satisfying. Um, I want to move forward. Walker Evans, her friend, said of this picture, um, the picture is both a dance and a loving lyric. To anyone sensitive to dance, this picture is inebriating. It is, of course, a lucky miracle of timing. But when you see an unbelievable confluence of chance in a photograph, remember that the operator was there, booted and spurred, as he knew. So the point being, she had to be there on the ground and she had to have this constant alertness to the possibility of a picture um, such as this. So look at the boys, look at this trio, a kind of classic group, the jock, the funny one, the nice one, each with a stick of some kind, the smallest of them with an unfeasibly large branch. Where on earth did he get that in this pretty barren landscape? Levin, Levitt photographed children mostly, partly because they were out, they were out in the landscape, in the urban landscape, partly I think because she wanted to acknowledge their command over their surroundings, their fearlessness, the maturity of their demeanor, and their emotional exchanges, the ways in which their activities and games prefigured adult behaviours. So even at their most active, as here, there's something composed and considered about their stances. Look at how they're disposed, one angling left, the other darting right, the central figure a mediating upright. So it feels composed, inevitable. At the same time, there's no staging here. There's no element of rhetoric. And compare it maybe to some of the photographs that Aaron Siskind took for his Harlem documents around about the same period where you feel he, Siskind has the desire for the photograph to say something about the conditions of the inhabitants, about their aspirations. And you never feel that urge to make a picture speak in the same way uh, with Levitt. And then look at the setting, the scruffy setting and the, the, the graciousness that she's managed to confer upon that as well. It is a scruffy, vacant lot, the kind that often appears in photographs and paintings of Ben Shan, for instance, like this one. Um, although there the presentation somehow is more abrupt, less lyrical. Not romantic, though. The broken window pane, the newspaper behind, they speak of neglect and abandonment. But here, I think the use of the regulating lines, if we can call them that, it is not too grand a term which she uses cleverly, those of the wall, the windows, yes, but also that upright and that horizontal, those stains on the brickwork that point to a kind of larger order. And then the slightly shaky sh score chart, which offers another grid in miniature, attenuated like Manhattan's, that tell us that this is the home ground of the Reds. Interesting to note that misplaced apostrophes were common even then. Now, I assumed initially that the Reds were a New York team, but it seems not. They're much more of a local outfit, big in Spanish Harlem, but not much beyond. And we're reminded, of course, that Levis's earliest exhibited photographs were of chalk signs, the drawings made by children, the simplest means by which inhabitation is registered. And you might think back to that photograph by Walker Evans. And then a final regulating line. There's the thin line of sunlight cutting across the back of the dusty lot. A reminder, along with the patch of sky, there's never much sky in her photographs, in the top right corner, that weather and the elements do still play a part in this urban milieu. The sky appears only rarely, but life is flourishing, and it's doing so within the constructed affordances of a Manhattan grid. So even as we enjoy the formal qualities of this picture, we are constantly aware that they are produced by these people and the setting acting together. Photography attends to what's there. In revisiting Helen Levitt's work for this session, I came across a line from Wallace Stevens that Sandra Phillips tells us Levitt kept in a scrapbook, where he says, in the presence of extraordinary actuality, 
consciousness takes the place of the imagination. And this seems to me a useful thought for us working in architecture now. Um, <clears throat> this idea that we are in the presence of extraordinary actuality and that we should learn maybe to attend to it, to value it, to seek to make sense of it. I spoke of using pictures as points of departure, but of course they're not that. They are always ultimately ends in themselves. Um, and I'll end there. Thank you. Now I must stop share. Oh, I did have one more point, but I'm 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 not gonna go there. <laughs> it's a better ending. Thank you. So thank you, thank you everybody. Um I'm conscious of time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm conscious of time. We're, we are at, um, at half past seven. So I'm going to suggest we take maybe 10, maybe 15 minutes. I don't want to exhaust people's patience. If we could maybe talk about a couple of, maybe talk about a couple of points that came up across the presentations. And we've also got um, uh, uh, some questions actually coming through as well. Um, I see one from David Leatherbrow. I'm just going to jump straight in and read out David's question. Um, he's asking, um, maybe he or others could comment on the truth of photography. I might ask Thomas to talk about the truth of photography because he spoke about it. Um, the talk suggests it may not be the truth of what is factually given, but instead are also the abundance of a vivid implication. In other words, not necessarily the facts of what's there or what appears, but something beyond that. Maybe, well, I'm putting words in David's mouth now, but Thomas, do you want to? Would you have yeah, I, mean, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, this propaganda, which has to be identified by reading what's behind the picture or by reading the intentions of what, what, the, what the set of reasons uh, uh, had been to, for, for the author to make a photograph. And I think it's it's just there, there was a you, longer period where uh, you know there, there was a lot of talk about the people would say your photography your photographs lie so they don't they don't say the truth but what I mean with the truth is um, that indeed photograph photographs say something when I was a when I was a uh, young boy I I had my first striking contact with photographs were uh, of a soldier uh, album that my father had when he was a soldier in the in Hitler's uh, army and he, he had his own things that he would, would talk about uh, from it, you know, about his experiences but the album said different things to me and they were not sensational they just you know they they, they were, it was a picture from him in his uniform when he was on vacation from the front where it was clear that at certain points he seemed to have been a proud soldier which of course was very very problematic for me and there were lots of photographs you know also from in, in the other uh, albums of my you know, the grandparents and history and they all they all were speaking to me a lot <laughs> so there was something truthful in there that the oral memory uh, you know, that didn't completely match to the oral uh, uh, history of our family, but um, so, and I thought, yeah, the photographs tell, you tell a lot that's still debatable and, yeah, and, and exposed to, yeah, and a matter of interpretation, but, you know, I was, yeah, so that's why I'm saying photograph, I, I prefer for you, uh, several decades to just say photographs you tell the truth if you if you're able to read them mm. and then you have to you put yourself in the shoes of the person who made the photograph you know i when i i I've, i looked at you know, when i was young i looked at uh, uh walker evans first and last in their book with no text it's just a picture there's not even the captions under the photographs and you just start to wonder, like, what kind of person it was Walker Evans or Helen Levitt or August Zander? Why, why did these pictures become, it turned out like they it turned out? And that's very fascinating. You know, recently, I, I, I bought a new biography of Walker uh, Evans um, by 
Svetlana Alpos, which I find pretty utterly interesting and very um, kind of a new observation because she talks much more about Evans's time in Paris when he was a very young man and how that influenced and his knowing of Ajay. So it's very interesting. So mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's it's helpful thing just to say you know, you're telling yourself every photograph says the truth. And that's a fantastic <laughs> starting point <laughs> to dig in and make an effort and read it. Mm -hmm. it. Mark, do you want to comment on that or do any, Mary maybe? I, um, oh, I'm not, I'm not muted, which means I can speak. You can speak. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's a really, uh, I, I tend to agree with, with Thomas, and, and um, of course, one I, I've looked, you know, through through many, many, many books of photography, uh, and um, perhaps didn't say to myself, imagining myself in the other shoes, but just imagining the realities that were depicted in these in these images, um, the worlds that were in them, and. And for some reason, uh, we, we've talked about the issue of empathy before, uh, I felt extraordinary tenderness for the people and the artifacts in them, yeah. as, if, as if the photograph was a vehicle to allow me to meet those things. Yeah. And then I imagined that meeting that took place between the photographer and the, and the subject. Yeah. That's why I kind of go end up going back to the, that those um, Timothy O'Sullivan pictures. And I don't know if he was affected by his photography of dead soldiers in the American Civil War, but it seemed to me that as he was approaching landscapes or indigenous people, um, he did so in a completely different way from, from, mm. from his contemporaries. It seemed to be that he wanted to meet them somewhere. He allowed them to be themselves, whether landscapes or individuals, and approach them. And um, and so I think that's a true encounter. And that's perhaps where truth is for me in pictures. In the encounter, in the meeting. Mm. Yeah, I think that's right. Great. Hey, could, uh, Hugh, could, could I just add, I mean, I think I would take truth and I would put an S on it, truths. Uh, and I think it's really important, particularly now, <laughs> for us to include and to read these photographs in, in many different ways so many different voices can be there. And Hugh, I particularly like the way you showed us the Helen Levitt contact sheets, mm -hmm. uh, because I think we also need to read beyond the frames. And um, Ashling, I really, your work is fantastic. And I felt that, you know, you gave us an insight, as you said, into how the work is designed, how it's conceived. And, you know, so often, with uh, photographs of buildings, it's the construction process, it's that ideal moment in time when the building you know, is just fresh and new. Uh, and then what I'm interested in, the kind of afterlives that the, the building has as well. So I think there, there are many different truths and I think we have to find ways to, to bring those to light in both our text and the kinds of um, images that we talk about and the images that we create. And, um... I'm, I'm noting from Peter Seeley a comment about which picks up on Jesus's word empathy, use of the word empathy, which I would also think is very appropriate, you know, as a way of trying to think about this, the act of photographing, the encounter. Mm -hmm. There's a question, an interesting, interesting question, lots of interesting questions, but a question from Stephen Collard about the rectilinear form of the photograph, something we maybe mostly take for granted. And, and there was another question about the frame. Um, is that freeing or limiting? Is it possible to push against it? How do you how do you use it? Ashling, do you want to talk about that? Because you do try to play with ideas of framing and images and so forth. Yeah, like I I mean I don't I don't know if I feel it like yeah maybe. Um, I think what I'm interested in I guess is how images relate to each other or how they start to um generate more questions in in like in uh combination with each other or um i mean that the 
the rectangle is kind of boring for sure but I mean the the circle is the true like imprint of the lens um mm. and obviously I suppose when start, people start using large format lenses like Thomas Street or Stephen Shore's later work um you get to a like a more representative version of that circle um yeah, I, I, I guess it's not the shape maybe that I have an issue with. It's like how they start to make a build up in your head later on. Hmm. Yeah. Any, anybody else want observations on the, the frame, the rectilinear frame? Sorry. Uh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a tricky thing. I, I was thinking there's now a, 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 a very good Hockney exhibition in, in where I live in Houston where and, and they show some of these sort of canvases that he that he that he makes already with a sort of with a with a six six sided figure, but it's not an it's not an exercise. That and I think for painters historically, there's been I mean changing the shape of the canvas was a way to add like a new challenge in a way because the, that it's different because the the painter sort of works with the within the shape of the canvas from scratch versus for the photographer just the just the the shape of the negative is so it's such a given, right? That, and also maybe something has to be said about that is that the power of photographs is that they are very, very radical simplifications of the world, right? That uh, yeah. the reality as we as we apprehend it in, in life is is much has many more dimensions and, and, and complexities. And I think the strength of photography is precisely this brutal simplification and the rectangle is a very efficient tool to do that. And a question from Chris Boyle, well, asking me specifically, but maybe everyone, sure. um, about photographs that include or are enabled by architecture, but where architecture is not the subject matter. Yeah, and 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 what architects can learn from looking at these more closely. I mean, I think it is this thing. I mean, I go back to Mary and John Sarkowski, who I was jealous to find out Mary met when he taught in Cornell. <laughs> um, but but. Um, but he his distinction with his talk about the artifacts of the life facts or what sullivan called the artifacts and life facts i think that's what he was interested in um and and actually it's very interesting because he, he he tells a, a story in the introduction to the book about going to frank mm -hmm. lloyd wright to see if frank lloyd wright will buy some of his pictures some of the pictures he's made of the sullivan because he she, she knows obviously that wright worked for sullivan and he goes to Taliesin and rings on the gate, right at the gatehouse, and she, I want to sell some photographs, and she says, "No, go away." And then she, he, he says, "Oh well, I, actually, I'm bringing some photographs of Frank Lloyd Wright's work that I want people to look at." And then he, he's ushered in, and Wright goes through his photographs, and um, he he says, "These are the best photographs I've ever seen of Sullivan's work, except this project, which is a really rotten project. It's a, it's a, I think it was a mausoleum." Project, but it says apart from this project and i should know that's the one i worked on <laughs> and he has a great story about walker evans in that introduction as well actually yeah. but but the, the 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 i think for me what sarkowski was seeing was he was seeing the architecture in life that that that's oh. what his he was paying attention to it oh. in that way and that's why I, I thought it was worth i mean there's other there's other photographers of architecture who work in that way but thomas uh, Candida Hoffer, I think, often uh, is able to 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 engage with architecture in that way. Um, well, you, you know, it's interesting. I, I was privileged to meet John several times because he was a distinguished visiting professor here at Cornell, and he did this wonderful show. I think in the late sixties or seventies that was called "Window and Mirror." And just to get back to the idea of the frame that. It can be both. It can be both a window and it can be a mirror, uh, as well. And you know, I was just thinking, you know, why why are we so stuck on the rectangle? And is it because you know, like Frank Lloyd Wright, the rectangle has the possibility to expand, whereas, I mean, there are oval um, mirrors and oval windows, but they're they're self-contained and they're perfect, and you can't violate those in some way. So, um, again, I'm thinking a lot about John and his really you know, wonderful work as both a curator and a photographer. Yeah, yeah. and a writer about photography. Mm. I think one of the best writers about photography. 
Um, and actually, Alva, congratulations to Alva Graney in the chat who just mentioned, as you said it, she wrote, Sarkowski's Mirrors and Windows comes to mind. So there you go. That's prescient indeed. Um, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm conscious of time. I know that we've been here now almost coming up to two hours, and I don't want to exhaust people's patience. I'm, I'm Getting really, dark in Berlin. Nine, nine, getting dark in Berlin. I think that's, that's nice. Right <laughs> so, and, and nearly lunchtime in Houston. So, <laughs> I think uh, I should probably. Um, that's a good thing with Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it is. Yeah, it's possible to do these things. Can be really and, global. Yeah, and there's a sort of intimacy to it, which is good. But, but ultimately, it would have been nice to be able to share a glass of champagne. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so. It falls to me maybe just to say thank you again to Mary and to Mark and to Thomas and to Ashling and to Jesus. It's really been great to have your uh, contributions to this evening. I think it's made it very special for me, uh, so much so that I managed to mute myself at a vital moment. <laughs> um, but thank you very much to all of you. And thanks again to Victoria Benjamin for organizing the evening and to Val uh, again for 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 chairing and uh, getting us off to a great uh, start. Val, should I go back to you? Um, no, just to say oh. thank you, Hugh, again, for um, bringing together such a, a fascinating evening. It's been really um, stimulating and moving. And um, so thank you all. Um, and if you want to hear any more insight into these um, photographs and some more of Hugh's wonderful um, analysis of them, then do um, snap up a copy of his book um, and use the special offer. Um, and thank you all for coming along. Thank you. I should thank just you. Go, by the way. Congratulations, Hugh. Congratulations, Hugh. I should thank just you. tell you, by the way, look. Let's talk soon. Hi. Oh, oh, there it is. Bye -bye. Fantastic. Yeah. Stay Here's safe my, and well. My thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, and Val and Victoria. Well, yeah, and um, thanks, guys. Hopefully, next time we can meet in person. That would be lovely. Yeah. At the pub. At the uh, yeah, somewhere you know, somewhere there, nobody has yet mastered the art of a satisfactory Zoom exit. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and my Zoom wave for months, but still, yeah. it still <laughs> looks like Skippy the Bush Kangaroo when he's dialing the telephone. But anyway. Yeah, I don't know. I always think of the Hollywood Square games. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's nice to see the people that are here. That's nice. I'm getting messages. Lovely. Yeah. Did, did we record this, by the way? I was just wondering. I don't think we did. No, Victoria did. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, brilliant. Okay. And, we... and I think she's also going to preserve all the questions and I'll comments. Be really comments. Great. Yeah. I'll say, yeah. Would you be I think Victor is also going to email if, if anyone missed the actual live event. I think she will um, oh, send great. a link to it. Right. Yes. Great. We'll. we'll see that then. Have a lovely evening. Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Hugh. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you, Hugh. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Mark. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Hugh.